Hi, my name is Alex Udris. Welcome to the very first Bold Method live stream. This is my first time doing it, so uh, hopefully you don't have to bear with me too much. But we're going to be doing these every other week. So bi-weekly, if you think about it like a flight review. And we're going to do three of them during the week. We're going to do a VFR1, an IFR1, and then uh, a session that's focused on career guidance and, and pilot hiring, helping you get ready for an interview or getting ready for an airline career. And so today, on the VFR topic, we're going to talk about stalls. And we get a lot of different questions about stalls, but we're going to focus in on, I think, the very most basic type of a stall. We're going to look at why a stall happens, and we're going to look at power off stalls. We're going to look at them straight and turning, and we're going to look at a falling leaf stall as well. At the end of the day, power off stall might be the simplest stall. Um, it's kind of the first one that you learn to do, but if you really understand it and feel comfortable with it, everything else, power on stalls, accelerated stalls, uh, secondary stalls, if you're working on your CFI or cross-controlled stalls, all of them come very, very naturally. And I think everybody starts out flying uh, a little bit afraid of stalls. Some people really never get over it. And I think a lot of that is because they don't practice it enough. And other people really learn to enjoy it. In fact, if you talk to people who are building their own aircraft, like the Pades, uh, with the aircraft that they built, you'll find they're always doing stalls to discover how their aircraft will react to different scenarios. So it's something that you really shouldn't just do just as you're training for your private commercial or CFI certificate, but you should do over and over. And in fact, uh, if you look at uh, our airplane, 216 Bravo Delta on four flight, you'll see I go out uh, to Laramie a lot. And I typically practice stalls and steep turns and stuff on my way out, and then a whole bunch of landings and then come back. Even though most of our operational flying is point to point or filming, um, staying proficient in stalls really helps me fly the airplane a little bit better. And if you're nervous about them right now, don't feel bad. I know I was. Colin, my business partner, I'm sure he was because I've flown with him. Um, it's just something that, that everybody can be a little bit nervous about. One of the things to think about is a stall isn't inherently dangerous. It is a very normal and natural part of flying the airplane. In fact, it's specifically designed into the airplane, its structure. When they're designing an airplane or a wing or the elevator, the stall factor is something that goes right into the principle of that design. So you're not doing anything unusual. Of course, the problem with the stall is when it's unexpected, when you do it at low altitude, uh, unintentionally on that base to final turn, you're trying to stretch the glide into the runway, that's where a stall can kind of go bad. So we'll talk about that. So today we're talking about the power off stall, but just some basic stall stats. Between 1993 and 2001, the Air Safety Foundation studied 450 different stall accidents. They found that 80% of them happened between the surface and 1,000 feet, so below 1,000 feet AGL. And if you think about that, we're talking about the traffic pattern. So 80% of the stalls, at least that they studied, happened essentially in the traffic pattern. And when you talk about a power off stall, where is that most likely to happen? Well, we've got a couple different places, and I'm going to pull this up here. If you take a look at over here, a basic traffic pattern, there's two areas where you can really find yourself susceptible to stall. The first one is this base to final turn. Um, the base to final turn, it's probably the most difficult turn in flying, and that's because you're at really, really low altitude. Um, your airspeed's starting to slow. In the Cirrus, you know, you, your configuration's set, but in some aircraft, you're typically extending more flaps. You're going to extend them right as you roll out on final. You could be tight into the runway. The winds are changing, so it's definitely one of the most difficult turns. And then you're also trying to keep your eye on the runway, and you're trying to keep your eye out the nose and your eye on the airspeed. And so, the base to final stall, or the base to final turn point, that can be pretty dangerous. Um, and we've got a video here that is a pretty typical base to final problem. So if you take a look here, this is in Steamboat. This video is from our landings course. But we, what we're doing is we're rolling out of our base turn onto final. And you can see this right here is the classic scenario. The runway is over here and we have overshot final. And the problem that we're gonna run into is if we try to get the airplane back over to final, we're really gonna to have to tighten up that bank. And of course, if we increase our bank, 
We increase our load factor. If you go up to 60 degrees of bank, essentially you're gonna stall about 40% faster. So at the end of the day, as you tighten that turn up, your stall speed goes up. Next thing you know, you enter an accelerated stall or you could cheat stand on that left rudder to pull that nose in towards the runway. And of course, now you're uncoordinated. As you stand on that left rudder, the airplane starts to bank in. Of course, you're gonna roll in opposite aileron to keep it from rolling too much. You pull back and now you end up in the classic cross-controlled stall and that can end up in a spin. We're gonna go into more detail on that when we talk about spins, but this right here is why base to final is so dangerous. Okay, so if we take a look at final approach, right here. That's the other area where people are susceptible to a power off stall. And if you think about it, final approach, actually, you know, you're going straight, you've got the runway in sight. Why are you going to end up stalling? There's, there's two big reasons. Number one is target fixation. You're focused on that aiming point. You're not looking at your gauges. You're focused at the runway. And that's something you should be doing. You should be watching the runway. You need to be scanning inside and out, inside and out. But a lot of your time spent looking at the runway. And of course, if you lose track of your airspeed, you're fixated on your aiming point. Next thing you know, you're starting to bring that pitch attitude up, the yoke back as you're trying to stretch your way in and you enter an unexpected power off stall. Of course, the other time is stretching the glide. So if you've done a power off landing an emergency, emergency approach to a field and you realize you're not going to make your point, it's just natural to try to stretch that glide by bringing the nose up. It feels like it should work. Of course, it absolutely doesn't. Keeping the airplane at glide speed is the only way you're going to get the maximum distance essentially out of your glide. But those are the places where power off stalls are likely. And so the goal of doing a power off stall or practicing stalls, it's really to prevent yourself from getting into the scenario. And if you start to get into the scenario, it's to help you identify it right away so that you can get yourself out of it. So the Air Safety Foundation found that with average piloting skill in a standard general aviation light aircraft, single engine aircraft, if you identify a stall right as it's imminent, right as it actually occurs, it takes between 100 and 350 feet to recover from that stall. So if you catch it right away, even on a turn from base to final, you should have more than enough altitude to recover. And that's why it's so important to identify what it feels like and get used to the controls and the way they react, the way the aircraft feels as it starts to enter a stall, what you're gonna see and what you're gonna hear. And you wanna keep doing that over and over again as you go through your flying career because it's easy to forget. You know, As you start to get into cross countries and just flying for fun, you're flying professionally, you're not practicing that as often, you can start to lose that feeling. But if you can recognize it right away, the airplane's very easy to recover. And you'll find we do a power off stall here in the SR-22 Turbo. It's a pretty heavy aircraft. It's surprising how little altitude we're gonna lose during that recovery. Of course, the problem is if you get uncoordinated and you take the wrong corrective action, then you end up in a spin. And what they found is even with a test pilot, once you're in a developed spin, it is very difficult to recover without at least a thousand foot loss of altitude. And so that's the concern we have with stalling in a pattern, is that if you get yourself into an unexpected stall and then into an unexpected spin, even if you're a test pilot, chances are you're gonna have a hard time getting the aircraft back to straight and level flight. Okay, so let's talk about what a stall is. And essentially, a stall is when your angle of attack exceeds the aircraft's critical angle of attack. And that critical angle of attack it depends on each wing design, and then it can also depend on configuration if you lower flaps or any of those things. But essentially, all you're doing is exceeding a certain angle of attack. So I'm gonna pull up a video here, and if you take a look, let me clear this out. Okay, right here, what you can see is an aircraft where we're below our critical angle of attack. So if you look, our angle of attack is the angle between the relative wind right here, that's this orange line, and your cord line. And if you look at our wing, we've created this little green line here, that's our angle of attack. And then the critical angle of attack right now is somewhere above that, it's right here. And what you can see is this little red area right here coming off the back of the wing. That's airflow separation. So airflow separation 
always occurs. It's happening even when you're flying at high speeds, but as you slow down and increase your angle of attack, that separation starts to move up the back of the wing. So it doesn't just happen at a stall. It's just that once you've reached a stall, the separation has moved so far up the wing that it starts to decrease lift. So let's take a look at that. So as we hit play here, you can watch that separation grow. Okay, the angle of attack starts increasing. And as we get close to the critical angle of attack, you can see the separation has moved up the wing, though lift is still increasing as we get close to the critical angle of attack. And boom, right there, we're right at the critical angle of attack. You can see the wing is generating maximum lift. But at the same time, we've got a ton of separation back here. And what's going to happen now is the separation creeps up so far that the lift dramatically drops. And boom. When that happens, stability, the center of gravity, which is located forward of the center of lift, pulls the nose down. And it essentially gets the airplane out of the stall. So this is what I said. A stall is a normal design maneuver in an airplane. When they're designing an airplane, they design it to safely stall. They design the nose to drop. And that's why it's so important to keep the CG within the center of gravity range because as long as you're within your aircraft's CG range, the aircraft's nose will come down to help you recover from a stall. Okay, and so what you can see is as we bring that nose down, going back to the telestrator here, you can see the angle of attack comes down and separation moves its way back to the back of the wing. Okay, so why does the airflow separate? Um, everybody loves aerodynamics, so let's take a look at that. It has to do with the pressure gradient. And so I'm gonna start at the very beginning here. Um, if you take a look, this is an airplane in general level flight. You can see the relative wind here in orange, and you can see this pressure gradient that we have right here in light blue. And it's gonna show you how much lift and the way the lift is distributed along the wing. What you can see is in level flight, you kind of have most of the lift coming from maybe right here. That's why the largest hump in this pressure gradient is here. And so if you were to take a, a barometer and walk down the wing, what you'd find is as you moved towards this point here, the hump, you'd find the static pressure is decreasing. And then as you move down the wing this way, you're gonna find that the static pressure starts increasing. So we're decreasing pressure, decreasing pressure. Now we're at the point of lowest pressure, and now we're increasing pressure, increasing pressure, and increasing pressure. So if you think about that, you're really moving from low to high. The airflow is moving from low pressure to high pressure. Okay, so if you think about this, this is no different than a pressure gradient. With weather, we're walking into the wind. And I know the wind's not blowing backwards on the wing, but it's still moving from low pressure to relatively higher pressure. It's walking into the wind. And because you're moving into the wind, that takes energy, okay? So that airflow has energy and that energy is keeping it attached to the wing. It's still generating lift. But the further it moves down the wing, the less energy it has. So if we go back to the telestrator here, you can see as we start moving down this wing, we're actually getting sucked into the low, picking up some energy. And then from here, all of a sudden, now we're moving away from the deepest low and we start to bleed off energy and bleed off energy and bleed off energy. And at some point in time, the airflow runs out of energy, it peels off and it separates out. Okay, so let's go ahead and move forward in time. We're gonna to start to increase our angle of attack. Okay, so you can see as we increase angle of attack, and I'm gonna draw that actually so you can see it really easily, this cord line. You're, it's kind of a sloppy drawing, we'll try that again. Okay, there we go, we got the cord line. You can see as this airflow starts to increase, see how the angle of attack is increasing between the relative wind right here and the cord line. As this starts to increase, you can see, I'm gonna do it one more time, that the pressure distribution moves forward on the wing and it gets into this big hump. So if you look at this, I'm gonna clear all this. If you look at this now, all of this lift is developed right here and you have this very strong low pressure area. So as we increase the angle of attack, that low gets really, really strong compared to the higher pressure air back here. And now it takes a ton of work for the air to stay stuck to the wing as it moves back. As it moves back, it's bleeding energy very quickly and it starts to separate off. So, of course, 
Everybody's felt the buffet. If you practice a stall, you can feel the controls buffeting. What is that? Well, that's separated airflow that comes off turbulently and it's hitting your elevator. Some aircraft, you can really feel the buffet. Other aircraft, it's really, really mild. But what's happened is you're getting all of that air that's run out of energy as it's moved down the back of your wing. And now it's starting to strike your uh, horizontal stabilizer. And so back to the telestrator here, what you can see is we'll just quickly play it out. We get to this point of maximum lift. Essentially, we're right at the critical angle of attack. And what you can see is the separation, we've showed it with red here today. The separation has moved so far up the wing, okay, so that now it occupies so much of the wing that all of a sudden lift starts to drop. We've, we've passed through our critical angle of attack and the amount of lift generated by the aircraft drops. So let's take a look at that. We've got a lift diagram here. Okay, so right here, this is a lift diagram. And if we draw on it, what you can see is the, I'll draw it with red, the critical angle of attack is basically right here. And as we increase angle of attack all the way up to the critical angle of attack, the aircraft is generating more and more lift. At the same time, it's generating more and more separation. But once you get to that critical angle of attack, you have so much separation that all of a sudden, boom, the lift drops off. And if you take a look at this, it drops off really, really steeply. The slope on that graph, it's a lot steeper than it is over here, okay? So here, that's part of the reason that you're gonna see a wing drop when you end up in a stalled scenario. So if, let's say, this is your left wing right here, and your right wing's at a slightly higher angle of attack here, they're at a much different amount of lift. And so because of that, whichever wing is at a higher angle of attack is going to drop. And as you get into a deep stall where you're dealing with this very, very steep lift drop off, any difference in angle of attack between the two wings is gonna end up dropping a wing. So if you're in a power stall and you're like, man, I'm, I'm really struggling to keep those wings from dropping, part of what's happening is they're not at the same angle of attack. And part of that's probably because the nose isn't pointed straight into the relative wind. If you're yawed into the wind, then the, wind that, the, the wing that is yawed closest to the relative wind, it's gonna be at a lower angle of attack, it's generating more lift. The wing that is yawed away from the relative wind is gonna have a higher angle of attack, it's gonna generate less lift and it's gonna drop. So if you're noticing that, like, man, my, my wings keep dropping in a stall, part of it is you're probably not fast and light enough on the rudder and the nose isn't perfectly aligned with the relative wind. So the amount of stall on both wings is different. One of them's dropping to the left and right. We'll take a look at that um, in more detail in a second. So let me clear this drawing and what we're gonna do is take a look at the stall progression. So as I said, wings are designed to stall. And if we look at a standard power off stall, what you're gonna see is that they're designed to start stalling here at the root, and then on a typical GA plan form, move out toward the tips. And in airplanes these days, they're gonna do all kinds of things to try to keep you stalling at the root the earliest because it gives you the most warning. And if you think about it, your control surfaces, your ailerons, they're way out at the wingtips. So we want to try to keep airflow going over those wingtips as, as long as possible so that the ailerons do remain effective as you start to enter a stall. And one of the basic ways of doing that is washout. You notice the root's much steeper um, angle of incidence, and as you move towards the wingtip, it ends up looking level or maybe slightly pointed down. And so that washout is essentially promoting that root to wingtip stall pattern. Um, there's a couple other things, and we'll take a look at that in a second, but let's watch this move. So as we increase the angle of attack, what you're gonna see, you can see that area starts to move out, and as the aircraft exceeds the critical angle of attack, this area here, of stall or airflow separation is occupied so much of the wing that it's gonna start to drop lift. But ideally, we're trying to keep this area here still flying. Of course, what happens is then the nose drops and the aircraft is designed to get itself right out of the stall. 
because as the nose comes down, it immediately reduces the angle of attack. That is the one thing that you need to do to recover from a stall. You don't have to increase power. You just need to decrease your angle of attack. And so the airplane's designed to do that for you. Of course, in the stall recovery procedure, we do increase power because it helps change the relative wind and it gets us climbing. And in an unintentional stall, we wanna start climbing, but we're gonna demonstrate a falling leaf today. So you'll see, I never add any power. I keep the, the stick and the Cirrus all the way back. It's just one stick and I hold it all the way back. And you'll see the airplane flies itself in and out of the stalls repeatedly because it's designed to do that. Okay. Um, so we talked about how washout is going to solve and help um, the aircraft stall from the root out to the tip. The other thing that you're going to see is you might see stall strips. So if you see those little triangles that are typically located here or um, right on the leading edge, they're there to try to help separate airflow. So it stalls here at the root before the tip. There's something else, and you, it's not just the Cirrus, um, though the Cirrus has it, and I think it's really cool. Um, you're starting to see it on a lot more aircraft. Um, it is, with composite wings, it's these double cuffed wings. So if you take a look at it, essentially the camber is different on this section of the wing than it is over here. So essentially what you end up here is this section is at a higher angle of attack. And then there's a completely different wing that's built on, and this one stays at a lower angle of attack. So one of the things that I hear in this, this isn't specific, this, this uh, lesson isn't specific to Cirrus, but I do hear it a lot. I hear that the Cirrus is really dangerous in a stall, and that's why they put a parachute on it, because the airplane is going to enter a spin, and it's completely unrecoverable or and totally uncontrollable. And I can tell you this, I spun uh, Cessnas and Cherokees and Warriors and all kinds of different aircraft and the 20 and the 22. And with what they're doing to wings now, building these double cambered wings, you find that they essentially are completely controllable in a stall. So it still doesn't mean you want to roll out of a stall with ailerons, but what you find now, especially in composite aircraft, is they're building stall protection um, and, and stall designs onto a wing so that you can pretty much fly it all the way through the stall. Okay, so let's take a look at this. What are our warnings? Well, first of all, we know that as we have stuff coming off the back, we're gonna get buffet. So one of our best warnings in the stall is you're gonna to start to feel the stick shake. This is even better than watching your airspeed because as you increase load factor, your stall speed's gonna increase. And most aircraft, especially if you're flying something with analog gauges, you have a fixed stall band. It doesn't look at your gross weight. It doesn't look at your load factor. It's not looking at your angle of attack. They just draw the, the, the red line, um, you know, essentially on the airspeed indicator for maximum gross weight. But if you think about it, um, when you actually load the airplane, you're not at maximum gross weight. So airspeed's a really bad indicator of when you're gonna stall. The buffet, on the other hand, is a fantastic indicator. But there's something you're gonna get even before that. And if you think about it, if you look back at this diagram, what you're gonna see is the airflow slows down. All of these right here, they have less pressure acting on them. So all of a sudden, they become a lot sloppier, uh, especially in a Cessna or a Warrior where you we have very light controls on the ground. You can move them up and down very easily. You can really start to feel those controls turn sloppy, especially if you've got a light grip on the yoke. That's a fantastic indicator. When you start to feel the controls get sloppy, you know you're getting really, really close to a stall. Um, you can also typically see the pitch attitude, but you need to be really careful about that because as you load up the aircraft with high load factor, that pitch attitude can be really, really low and you'll still enter an accelerated stall. And in fact, you'll even notice that the controls are still, they got a lot of pressure on them in an accelerated stall. So you won't feel them mushy there as well. And then finally, you can feel possibly the airplane starts sinking, that sinking feeling right, you, right before you stall, you can kind of pick that up. Um, those are all different ways to pick up that you're getting into a stall. And then of course, I would say the most common one 
is the stall warning system. Now, not all airplanes have them, um, but most of the ones that we train in, if you're training a Cessna, Piper, or Cirrus, you've got a stall horn. And the interesting thing about a stall horn is it's mounted on the wing so that it can kind of detect when that airflow moves over a certain part of the cord line and gets close to that critical angle of attack. That right there is an imminent stall. You're right about the stall. So as soon as you hear that horn go off, it's time to reduce the angle of attack and start bringing in power. Okay, so what we're gonna do, um, we're gonna actually take a look at a power off stall on the SR22 Turbo. Uh, we headed out south of Pueblo. Um, we went up pretty high at 10,500 feet, so it's high DA, which means that the airplane's definitely gonna wanna sink a little bit more, but you're gonna see that during recovery, if you're gentle with the aircraft, even a heavy airplane like the 22 Turbo really can recover and climb right out of a stall. Okay, so we'll start with a straight stall. Let me clear the telestrator here. Okay, and of course, we're going to do clearing turns. So we're jumping in 90 degrees into our 180 degree clearing turns. Um, you can see I've already got my flaps down at 50%. The SR22 Turbo has two different flap settings. All the Cirruses do, one at 50 and one at 100. So for this power off stall, I'm going to use full landing flaps. We're going to do it on a heading of west. And I'm going to enter the stall at 10,500 feet. I want to recover at least 1,500 feet above the ground. The ground here is at about 6,500 feet. So I've got a lot of room below me. 4,000 feet should be no problem. And, and I'm my airplane, I like to enter at 100 knots, holding 10.5. I'm going to bring my flaps down to full to allow the aircraft to start to slow down. Then I'm going to set landing power. In the SR22 Turbo, that's 30%. So in the Cirrus, remember, we measure our power in terms of percent. And so I'm going to set 30% power. And then I'm going to hold level flight. And I'm going to slow down to a slow approach speed, about 80 knots here. That would be a good final approach speed for the airplane. If you're having a hard time with power off stalls, you feel like it never really wants to stall, it could be because you're entering them too fast. I like to try to enter a stall, if there isn't any guidance from the manufacturer, basically on a short final landing speed. In the Cirrus, we like to cross the threshold at about 80, um, 80 to 85 on a normal full flap landing, so this is a perfect point. So now I'm going to establish a descent. I'm going down about 350 to 500 feet per minute. I bring my throttle to idle. I'm gonna to start to pitch up and in a second, you'll hear the imminent stall with the horn. And then you're gonna see the nose start to drop. Boom, right there. That's the aircraft recovering from the stall. So let's take a look at where I am at 10,340 feet. You can see that right here. I'm going down about 350 feet a minute. And the interesting thing about the SR22 Turbo uh, with the angle of attack indicator, it actually does dynamically move the red band um, to try to line it up right with my actual stall speed. Um, but watch what happens as I gently release back pressure and add in power to fly out. I'm gonna bring the power up. You can see it coming in. I'm releasing a little bit of back pressure. I don't dump the nose forward. And if you look, we're at 10,320 feet. So we lost maybe 20 feet on that recovery. Once the airplane is climbing, I'm going to bring my flaps from full to 50%. And then I'm going to accelerate to the manufacturer's select, uh, recommended flap retraction speed while climbing up, reaching VY. So in the Cirrus, I'm waiting for 90 knots. Once I come through 90 knots, I'm going to bring my flaps back up to full or to, to clean. And I'm going to accelerate, if you're doing this on a check ride, to VY, and I'm going to level out at the altitude my examiner told me. So I like to go back to the altitude I started from. Now I'm back to 10,500 feet. Okay, so if you think about that, it's a fairly simple maneuver. But where people run into trouble most often is that they don't realize the only reason the airplane is stalling is them. You're the person holding in that back pressure. You're the person holding the yoke all the way back. So to recover from it, you just need to stop doing what you're doing right now. Let a little bit of that back pressure out. One of the most common issues we see when it comes to recovering from a full stall is that people want to dump that nose to try to get back airspeed. And absolutely, it's not airspeed you're looking for. It's lowering the angle of attack. Okay, And by dumping the nose, you are absolutely going to lower that angle of attack. But at the same time, you're going to lose a ton of altitude. And if you stall this airplane in a real scenario, 
space to final turn, where you get distracted on final, or you end up, you're right on speed and you get nailed by a really strong bit of wind shear, a gust completely dies off, and you dump that nose, you could find yourself in the ground. So the key thing to think about is, you're the one with too much back pressure, just let it out. Relax your grip, let the nose come down while you bring that power up to full. And then you wanna take the flaps from full to 50% once the airplane starts climbing, okay? Um, and then from there, usually when your flaps have been cleaned up past their landing setting, they're generating more lift than they're generating drag. So there isn't a rush to clean up that partial flap setting. The airplane's gonna climb just fine. So what you wanna do is take your time to let it accelerate. That's something we see. People are in a rush to try to clean up everything. They drop their, they grab their flap handle and a Cherokee and they drop it all the way down or they pull everything all the way up and the airplane just mushes down and sinks. So essentially, you wanna get that full landing setting out if you've got it in because that generates more drag than lift. And that's gonna make it difficult to climb because you climb from excess thrust. So you need to get rid of that drag. But then once you're in kind of that front half of your flap settings, the partial flaps, give it time, let it accelerate. If the manufacturer doesn't have a flap retraction speed, let it accelerate to VX or VY, and then bring them up gently and climb yourself on up. Okay, so that's a straight stall, um, but let's take a look at a turning stall. Everybody is terrified, it seems, of turning stalls when we start doing them. I know I was, and I think part of it is, I think we all are afraid we're gonna end up in a spin. So first of all, if the airplane's coordinated, you really don't have that much more of a chance of entering a spin in a turning stall than you do in a straight stall. There are a couple things to think about. I'm gonna grab my old uh, UND airplane. I've had this almost as long as I've had my CFI certificate. If anybody's a UND grad, you'll recognize the old logo. Um, but when you're in a turn, if I'm turning like this, this outside wing, especially when I'm moving slow, is gonna move along a larger radius arc than my inside wing. So the outside wing is actually traveling farther in a turn than my inside wing. The slower you go, the more that is the case. So if you're in a really slow speed stall, this wing is gonna be moving faster. And it generally means that it's at a lower angle of attack and, and as you enter a stall, could be generating therefore more lift. So you might find if you're in a really, really slow stall, there could be a tendency to drop inbound or inward here towards the low wing, but it's, it really isn't that strong. The key thing is you wanna keep the airplane coordinated. And part of that is scanning inside and out, looking at your coordinator and looking outside. But a lot of it is also just feeling really comfortable in those rudder pedals so that you can keep that airplane naturally coordinated in a turn. And so this is the key. After this, we're gonna look at a wing drop, but the key is to use your rudder not your ailerons, to keep the airplane completely coordinated as you turn. So, okay, we're gonna jump into the stall in the Telestrator here. I'm in my last 90 degrees of my clearing turn, coming out and heading of west. I'm gonna enter at 10,500 feet again. I got my flaps at 50%. I'm gonna bring them down now to 100%. This will be a full landing configuration stall. Um, I'm doing a fantastic job holding altitude. And I'm gonna roll out at about 100 knots, and then I'm gonna start to drop my flaps and then slow down. And then, again, I wait till I'm about that, that final approach speed, 80 knots in the Cirrus. If there isn't a recommended speed for your airplane, kind of what you'd be on final approach, at that point, I'm gonna roll the aircraft into a turn. And I wait because I don't wanna do a full 360 degree turn as I'm stalling. So I'm at 80 knots. I bring the nose down for about a 500 foot per minute descent, right? Pretty standard descent. Right at that short final speed, I bring the throttle to idle and I'm gonna start adding back pressure keeping the aircraft in a coordinated turn. And you're gonna hear the imminent stall. And then, boom, the nose drops. Again, what you can see is if the airplane's coordinated, it's gonna fly itself out. That nose is dropped, it's not entering a spin. I'm going to increase power, allow that nose to come down just a little bit to decrease the angle of attack. And once the airplane's flying, I'm gonna roll it level. So I wait to use my ailerons until I've reduced my angle of attack and brought the aircraft level. As I'm climbing, I start to see a climb. I'm gonna bring my flaps up to 50%. And then I'm gonna wait to pull them all the way up until I get to 90 knots, Cirrus recommended flap retraction speed for the Turbo G6. And once I cross 90, flaps come up and I'm gonna continue straight out to 10,500 feet. 
Okay, so this is how you'd want to do it in a check ride. And in real life, it's the same thing. If you're stalling in a base to final turn, you've got the airplane in a bank, all of a sudden pff, the nose comes down. You don't want to roll anything yet. You just want to reduce that angle of attack, get the airplane flying again, then use your ailerons and coordinated roll level and climb. And you'll find you really don't lose that much altitude. The more you practice it, you can find you can get out of it with less than 100 feet of altitude loss. And that's the key. We're learning stalls, a couple reasons. Number one, so that you can recognize it before it occurs and prevent it from happening. And if you don't pick it up at the beginning, as soon as it occurs, you can get out of it. But the other thing I can also say is this. The more you practice stalls, the more you get comfortable with flying the aircraft, keeping it coordinated, using your rudders and using your ailerons. The more you do this, the more comfortable you feel. Okay, so everybody has had that wing drop. And there's a really, really classic question, and that is, um, if my wing drops, how do I recover? Do I recover with aileron or do I recover with rudder? So let's take a look at aileron. We're going into a full stall. You can see I'm increasing my angle of attack and my separation. It's moved itself up the wing. And so in a second, the aircraft's going to stall and you're going to see it drop to the left. Okay. And we're uncoordinated. We drop to the left. So now what do I do? Okay. So watch this aileron. As this aileron drops, increasing angle of attack to lift the wing, you'll see this turn more and more red. This aileron over here is going to turn green. It's actually moving up. It's decreasing the angle of attack on this wing. Okay, so this one is going to be higher and this one's going to be lower. And if you think about that, if we increase angle of attack after a stall, if you increase angle of attack after a stall, what ends up happening? Well, after you've exceeded the critical angle of attack, any additional increase in angle of attack is going to result in less lift, not more. So the problem is, as you drop that aileron on your low wing and increase the angle of attack on your low wing, all of a sudden, you're gonna stall that wing even more. Okay, so let's watch that happen. And you can see here, that aileron starts to go down, boom, and the aircraft drops towards the low wing. And now you can see how that low wing is really stalled, and that top wing is actually a lot less stalled. And this right here, is a great way to get yourself into a spin. So if you're uncomfortable when your wing drops in a stall and you're like, man, it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse, like I can't get that wing up. Part of it is probably because you're trying to roll yourself out of it, especially if you've got a really tight grip on the yoke because it's natural to try to roll the airplane level. That's how we fly, right? So it's really easy to do that. So what we really want to do is we want to correct with rudder. So let's take a look at this. We're going to watch this line right here. This is your relative wind. Okay, watch where the nose goes in relation to this, and you'll see why rudder works. So as the stall increases, we're pointing right into the relative wind. Boom, the aircraft stalls and dips. Now take a look. Here's our longitudinal axis. Okay, we're no longer coordinated. And so because of that, this wing right here is it a higher angle of attack, it's generating less lift, and it is more stalled, okay? And what we really want to do is just line that nose back up. And the tool we want to use there is the rudder. If we use the rudder, it will not change the angle of attack on either wing. If you use the rudder, it's essentially just going to line the airplane up with the relative wind. And as I add right rudder, it pulls the nose to the right, and you can see that stall evens itself out. So watch that one more time. I just bring that right rudder in there and you can see the wings are now stalled evenly. And the airplane's pointed back into the relative wind. Okay, so if you're in a stall and that wing starts dropping, use rudder to bring the wing up. And there's a great maneuver. If you've never done this before, definitely try it with an instructor first. But there's a great maneuver to develop that rudder feel, and it's called the falling leaf stall. Um, it's a fun maneuver to do once you get used to it. You really learn that the airplane is designed to safely stall, and you learn how to dance on the rudder pedals. So we have did that in the Cirrus R22. Uh, we turned off the yaw damper, so I actually had to do a little bit of work. Um, and let's pull that up.
Okay, so this time we're doing a clearing turn to the right. We're going to roll out on a heading of west. We're going to bring our flaps down. And if you're not familiar with the falling leaf, I'll kind of explain it as we complete our clearing turn here. A falling leaf stall is just basically a power off stall where you don't recover. You just keep the yoker stick all the way back and you keep the airplane at as high of an angle of attack as possible. And then you just use the rudder to keep the wings level and the airplane going straight. You'll see it kind of bob to the left and the right a little bit. You just dance on the rudders to keep the airplane going straight. So I'm gonna start here on a heading of west. Again, 10,500, 100 knots. I'm gonna bring my flaps down. They were clean, so we're gonna end up going all the way down to full for this stall. Um, and then you'll see me bring my power out. So here come my flaps to full. In a second, I'm gonna bring the throttle all the way to idle, and I'm just gonna keep the aircraft level. And then I'm gonna bring the stick all the way back into my lap and I'm not going to recover from the stall. I'm just going to keep the airplane as fully stalled as possible and dance on the rudders to keep the airplane going straight. And you're actually going to see this is really, really docile. Okay, so here comes the imminent stall. You hear it in a second. And here we are exceeding that critical angle of attack. And in a second, the nose is going to drop. There it goes. Okay, now watch. It's going to bob up and down. Okay, this is the airplane reducing angle of attack below and then again above the critical angle of attack. So we're just oscillating above and below the critical angle of attack. Fully stalled. And you can see the airplane wants to keep going straight. Okay, as it dips to one side, I just add opposite rudder and it keeps the airplane flying straight. Now I bring the power back in, but something to think about. You can see that the airplane is really, really docile, but there is something that is happening here. And that is, we're going down about 1,450 feet a minute. And that's the real thing about a stall. Okay, so a stall is a loss of lift. And it doesn't mean the airplane's going to enter a spin. In fact, as you saw from the, the falling leaf, it, it can be completely controllable. The problem is, once you let it develop into a deep full stall, you're basically falling out of the sky. And at that point in time, well, it's, it was very comfortable. If you do that at low altitude, you're going to end up in trouble. Okay, so that's a, t a look at a power off stall. Um, are there any questions? Uh, yeah, we do have a couple questions here. Uh, first off, one of the first questions is, how does weight affect stall speed? Okay, so if you think about it uh, in an airplane, if you think about it, um, actually, let me pull up a side view. I know I've got a good one here, so I'll go ahead and do that. Um, okay, if you think about it, um, the more weight you have, the center of gravity is pulling down, the larger you make this, okay, the more weight you have, the more lift you have. And so therefore you can't redesign the wing. The only way you're gonna solve that is basically by increasing your angle of attack. So the way you can think about it is, the more weight you have in the airplane, the closer you're going to be at any point in time to the critical angle of attack, because you're using, for a given airspeed, because you're using angle of attack to make up that extra lift you need. So if you add in weight, that means you're going to have to increase your angle of attack. That means your stalling speed starts to increase. This is the same reason why when you roll into a turn, your stall speed increases. Okay, I know you're not adding any weight in a turn, but as you roll into a turn, you're adding more lift because you have horizontal lift and vertical lift. Vertical lift stays the same to keep you up. Now you're adding some horizontal lift to make the airplane turn, so your total amount of lift increases. And the only way to generate that for a given airspeed is to increase your angle of attack. So both loading up the airplane with load factor in a bank angle or with people and gas, it's gonna increase your stalling speed. Okay, next question is, uh, in your experience, Alex, flying different airplanes, how much rudder do you need to use when you're doing a power off stall? Uh, that's a great question. It completely depends on the design of the airplane and the design of the rudder. Um, and so I could tell you uh, in the SR22 Turbo, actually you need very, very little rudder versus a 172 where I felt like I was dancing on that rudder more. Um, it just depends on the airplane. Uh, every airplane's rudder is designed to 
to safely control the airplane in a stall. But part of transitioning to a new airplane is just getting used to the control feel. I can tell you that flying 22 Turbo is completely different than flying a Cherokee or a Ronca Champ or a Super Cub. Each one of them can take more or less rotor control. Um, it really just depends on, on your airplane. Okay, and we got time for one more question here, and that is, uh, how does your CG location affect uh, stall and recovery? Okay, that is a great question. We'll go back to the Telestrator here. So first of all, um, I do want to say this. As long as your CG is within the CG limits, the airplane is designed to be recoverable from a stall. So people go, oh, you know, I really like being on the forward CG limit. Trust me. As long as you're within that envelope for your entire phase of flight, the aircraft will be stable enough to recover from a stall. There is nothing wrong with the CG in the middle or slightly aft in the envelope. In fact, uh, it improves your true airspeed, which we'll talk about some other time. But essentially, uh, what you will notice is this. So if we take a look, let's go to the Telestrator. We'll draw this out really quickly. Let's take a look at a CG range. First of all, keep in mind, the CG ranges on airplanes are really, really small. They're usually like a foot. And this is not even, yeah, this is much bigger than a foot. But the reality is the further forward that CG goes, if you think about it, it's an arm between here and here. The further away your CG moves this way, the more the nose is going to want to pitch down. So the reality is having a forward CG means the airplane is going to drop the nose, more firmly, you're going to feel it really come down quickly um, versus an aft CG. So it's just a lever. And the further forward that lever is, uh, that, that center of gravity is, the more pitch down you're going to get. But at the same time, I do want people to know, I mean, it's okay to have the CG anywhere in that envelope. You, know, you really don't want to fly within the full forward limit or in the very, very back limit because you're right on the edges. You just want it somewhere inside that envelope. Okay, well, thanks for joining in the first VFR uh, live stream. Uh, we really like to hear your comments and suggestions. We'll be doing another one, not next week, but the week after. So let us know what you want to hear about. Uh, I'd love to go into detail on spins or power, power offs or power on stalls or anything you guys are interested in hearing about. So either send us an email or chat it up in the comments uh, and we'll get back to that. And hopefully we'll see you next week for VFR. Uh, stay tuned and. Uh, about 10 minutes, we're going to talk about uh, initial approach fixes and how to select the right IAF for your instrument approach. So we'll see you next time.